Hi, I'm Adrian Inishevsky. I'm a PhD student in the lab of Vincent Pask. And today I will tell you about how cellular identity is established during development and how it can be erased and completely forgotten. I've always been intrigued about how during development, a single stem cell can give rise to a plethora of different cell types with distinct and highly specialized functions. Now we know that cells do it by going through series of sulfate decisions. And once established, those decisions are remembered and propagated throughout cell divisions. And because all of that happens without changes in the genetic sequence, it is a remarkable example of how epigenetic memory of cell identity is established. Now, although we know how to model development by differentiating stem cells, or even how to reprogram somatic cells back to stem cells, we still do not fully grasp what are the underlying regulatory processes driving these cell fate transitions. We do know that the way cellular identity is established or reprogrammed eventually comes down to switching genes on and off, depending on the requirements of a given cell type. And this is mediated by the function of transcription factors, which can bind to regulatory elements on the DNA and activate their target genes, therefore forming gene regulatory networks. In addition, long non-coding RNAs, as well as plethora of different chromatin processes are also involved, including histone and DNA modifications, chromatin accessibility, nucleosome occupancy, and chromosome architecture. And the real big question of my research was how all those processes come together to regulate early mammalian development and the very first cell fate decisions. And today I will tell you about two research projects that I have been involved in. The first one is going to be about totipotency. Here we ask, can we um, capture and maintain totipotent cells in vitro? And how should we even judge and evaluate totipotency? In the second project, we set out to better understand how is chromatin silencing erased. And here we try to identify which factors and chromatin processes might mediate and which might oppose chromatin activation. Here you can see early mouse pre-implantation development. It starts from a single totipotent cell. Totipotency is the ability of a cell to give rise to all cells of the conceptus, both embryonic tissues, which will give rise to the embryo proper, as well as extra embryonic tissues, such as placenta and the sac. However, already around 16 cell stage, totipotency is lost. And this is because cells can no longer, no longer give rise to both embryonic and extra embryonic tissues. And that's because the very first cell fate decisions start to take place. The first cell fate decision segregates the outer trophectoderm cells from the inner cell mass. Trophectoderm cells will give rise to the placenta, while inner cell mass cells will further segregate into the epiblast, which will give rise to the body of the embryo, and primitive endoderm, which will give rise to the yolk sac. We can also isolate self-renewing stem cell types from all three lineages of early mouse embryo from the blastocyst stage. And we can use those stem cells to study early pre-implantation development. We can isolate embryonic stem cells from the epiblast, trophoblast stem cells from trophectoderm, and extra embryonic endoderm cells from primitive endoderm. In addition, given the right conditions, we can ES cells can be combined together with trophoblast stem cells or even also with extra embryonic endoderm cells to generate uh, structures called blastoids. Blastoids are three-dimensional structures which highly resemble blastocyst stage of the embryo and contain all of cells from all of its three lineages. However, it's important to note that all those stem cell types um, can give rise to all cells from their corresponding lineages but not anymore from other lineages because they are not totipotent anymore. So how can we study totipotency in vitro? Recently, stem cells with totipotency-like features were reported, including two cell-like cells or extended or expanded potential stem cells called EPS cells. EPS cells were reported to have the ability to give rise to both epiblast as well as trophectoderm cells. They can be isolated from eight cell stage embryo or reprogrammed from ES cells. However, the real developmental potential of EPS cells has been a bit unclear. 
So to test to what extent EPS cells are like to depotent cells in the embryo, we engaged in this fantastic international collaboration with a group of Esther Posfai in US, the group of Janet Rosand in Canada, and the group of Freddy Glanner uh, together with John Shell in Sweden. And we used various in vivo and in vitro assays to establish criteria that can be used to evaluate totipotency in vitro. And then we assessed EPS cells using these criteria. So first, the first criterion is that the gene expression profile of totipotent stem cells should resemble that of totipotent cells in the embryo. So we asked whether EPS cells express genes the same way as totipotent cells in the embryo. And to do that, we generated a large single cell gene expression atlas of mouse pre-implantation development. And when we aligned EPS cells to this atlas, we found that their transcriptome resembles more epiblast stage rather than earlier totipotent stages in the embryo, like four or eight cell stage. The second criterion is that totipotent stem cells should have the ability to be converted to trophoblast stem cells. And so we ask whether EPS cells can be converted or differentiated to um, trophoblast stem cells. So we subjected EPS cells to trophoblast um, conversion and we assessed the activity of key trophectoderm markers. And we found that after 12 days of conversion, um, the EPS cells did not activate any of the assessed markers, suggesting that EPS cells are not, uh, cannot be readily converted to trophoblast stem cells. Third, um, totipotent stem cells should have the ability to give rise to the entire embryo with all of its three lineages. And indeed, recently, EPS cells were shown to have the capacity to generate blastoids, either in combination with trophoblast stem cells or even using only EPS cells, some blastoids could be generated. So this su suggests that EPS cells might be truly totipotent. Um, to test that, um, we generated again a large single cell gene expression atlas, but this time spanning both pre-implantation stages of mouse embryo development, as well as later post-implantation stages of development. And then we could project EPS-derived blastoids onto this atlas and see how they compare to the real embryo. And we found that overall EPS blastoids to large extent resemble Em the real embryos, you know, we found that in fact, both epiblast and primitive endoderm lineages were very well um, recapitulated in the EPS blastoids. However, there were still some problems. Um, first, the trophectoderm cells in EPS blastoids were highly underrepresented. And in addition, in our atlas, EPS blastoid trophectoderm al cells aligned to later uh, extraembryonic ectoderm stages. In addition, there were also many intermediate cells uh, with unclear identity, which in our atlas either didn't align to anything or aligned to much later post-implantation mesoderm lineages. So to better understand why the trophectoderm regulatory state is not well recapitulated in EPS blastoids, I inferred gene regulatory networks in our single cell atlas. And to do that, I used a computational tool called Scenic. Scenic allows me to uh, allows to allow to identify and quantify regulon activity in each individual cell, and regulon is a collection of a transcription factor together with all of its three all of its target genes co-expressed in the same cell. And with this data, I could confirm that indeed EPS blastoids to large extent uh, recover gene regulatory networks uh, present in the embryo, however, not fully. In particular, I found that many target genes of key transcription factors, key trophectoderm transcription factors are expressed in the embryo trophectoderm, but not in EPS blastoid trophectoderm, which, which in summary suggests that EPS blastoids to large extent recapitulate regulatory networks of pre-implantation um, uh, embryo, however, not fully, which could also help explain why those structures are rest in the development. Nevertheless, I think this data also shows that blastoids in general are a very useful model of uh, pre-implantation development. 
So the, uh, fourth and last and most stringent criterion is that totipotent stem cells should have the ability to give rise to both embryonic as well as extra embryonic tissues in vivo in chimeric mice. And, and we found that EPS cells do contribute to both um, embryonic as well as extra embryonic compartments. However, they do not functionally integrate in the, in the extra embryonic compartment. And the group of Janet Rosant who performed these key experiments found that EPS cells, as, which here you can see labeled in green with GFP, localize in the extra embryonic ectoderm lineages in the extra embryonic compartment. However, they do not activate key trophectoderm transcription factors such as L5 or TFAP2C, which suggests that they do not functionally integrate into those tissues. And altogether, these, these data shows that, show that EPS cells are not fully totipotent yet. And so the search for totipotency in mouse in vitro is still ongoing. In the same time, this brings me to the second part of my talk, which is about trying to understand how chromatin silencing is erased. And here we use sex dosage compensation to study the chromatin transition from the, from the repressed chromatin state to the active. So what is sex dosage compensation and how has it evolved? The evolution of sex chromosomes led to the atrophy of the Y chromosome. This left males with only one copy of the of X chromosome, and this created two dosage imbalances. First, between a single copy of the X chromosome and two copies of autosomes, and between a single copy of the X chromosome in males and two X chromosomes in females. So to solve these problems, Drosophila evolved a mechanism in which the only X chromosome in males is upregulated. In mammals, however, the male-female imbalance is compensated by shutting down one of the two X chromosomes in females. Now, in addition to that, whether mammals also upregulate the only active X chromosome to balance with autosomal chromosomes is still unclear and debated in the field. Nevertheless, the presence of the X chromosome inactivation in female mammals is very well established. And in fact, it is considered a paradigm to study development, uh, epigenetics, chromatin processes, and gene regulation. But this begs the question of how the cells are able to completely silence all the genes throughout the entire chromosome. X chromosome inactivation has been first described by Dr. Mari Lyon in 1961, and it occurs early in development. It is random, so each cell randomly inactivates one of two X chromosomes. However, this choice can also be sometimes skewed towards one or the other X chromosome. In addition, not all the genes undergo X inactivation. Some genes escape, and we call them escapey genes. And both skewing as well as escape from inactivation have important implication in the context of X-linked diseases. So this entire process is initiated by the single long non-coding RNA called EXIST. EXIST is expressed from the X chromosome itself, and it has the ability to coat it in cis and recruit repressive protein complexes, which first remove active chromatin marks such as histone acetylation, and instead deposit repressive mark, chromatin marks and DNA modifications, such as DNA methylation. This also leads to changes in the global chromosome architecture and topology. And all this leads to the very stable chromosome-wide gene silencing. In fact, almost all known repressive mechanisms are used by, during X inactivation to maintain stable silencing of the inactive X chromosome. And it is also a paradigm to study the epigenetic establishment of the epigenetic memory of gene silencing, because once the X is inactivated, it is, the inactivation is propagated throughout cell divisions and stably maintained, even if we remove exist. Um, so how this, given this elaborate and complicated silencing, can it be erased? Uh, how can we reverse this chromosome-wide gene silencing? The erasure of X, the X chromosome inactivation is reversible, and it, it happens in the process called X chromosome reactivation. 
X chromosome reactivation is, is also a developmentally regulated process. It happens in mouse in the inner cell mass, as well as in both mouse and human in the germline. And X chromosome re reactivation entails and requires the loss of exist, which is followed by the loss of repressive chromatin and DNA modifications and modifiers such as DNA methylation on, or histone deacetylases. And then uh, in turn, it involves reacquisition of the active uh, chromatin marks and reacquisition of the active chromosome topology, altogether leading to the reversal of chromosome, chromosome wide gene silencing. And this is why in this project, we are using X chromosome reactivation to study how chromatin silencing is reversed. To model X, re X chromosome reactivation in vitro, we are using reprogramming of somatic cells to induce pluripotent stem cells, to iPS cells. Simply by overexpression of four transcription factors, OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, we can induce reprogramming of somatic cells, such as fibroblasts, to iPS cells. And then these iPS cells reacquire then their potential to be differentiated into all embryonic lineages they can self-renew, and they reactivate pluripotency regulatory network. In addition, because reprogramming involves um, genome-wide remodeling of the epigenome, it also involves and leads to X chromosome reactivation in female cells. However, the link between pluripotency gene regulatory network and X chromosome reactivation and dosage mechanisms is unclear, as well as with how both X chromosomes maintain the correct gene dosage during reprogramming is also unknown and unclear. So together with Irene Talon, to, uh, another PhD student uh, in the PASC lab, we, we, use X, we use X chromosome reactivation during reprogramming to address those questions and to study and better understand the reversal of chromatin silencing. We established a system in which we induce X reactivation in reprogramming by reprogramming mouse embryonic fibroblasts to iPS cells. And then we can isolate reprogramming intermediates at discrete time points and perform a range of allele resolution, allele specific analysis, such as RNA sequencing. So the first question we had was, what is the timing of X reactivation? Do all genes reactivate at the same time during reprogramming? To test that, I first performed allele resolution bulk RNA sequencing and identified the transcriptional timing of gene reactivation during reprogramming. And I found that not all genes reactivate at the same time. Instead, there is a subset of genes that initiates reactivation early, and this is then followed by reactivation of most of the genes with delayed kinetics. And this is only after the pluripotency network is fully activated and exist is completely silenced. And there is also a subset of genes that reactivates even later. We call them very late reactivating genes. So then we asked what makes those genes uh, and what makes some of genes reactivate earlier than others. And we looked at a wide range of genetic and epigenetic features. And we found that early reactivating genes reside in a closer genomic distance to their nearest escapee genes. And this was very interesting because SKP genes have already been previously reported to reside in a special chromatin compartment with more chromatin accessibility and more chromatin structure. So this raised the possibility that early reactivating genes also reside in the special chromatin compartment. And this has recently been um, confirmed by others. And this also suggests that 3D conformation and the location of gene in 3D space might, in, might influence its um, stability of its silencing. And this, if true, could have important implication both in X-linked and other diseases. So the next question was why, however, most of the genes reactivate with delayed kinetics? And to test that, I to address this question, I tested the effect of different chromatin regulators on the reactivation kinetics. And 
I could I, I, I observed that inhibiting DNA methylation promotes X reactivation, which was in line with previous research in reprogramming. But I also found that inhibiting histone deacetylases one and three strongly and significantly increases the rate of X reactivation, which, which suggests that these enzymes could be an additional barrier to X reactivation during pluripotency induction. The next key question was how are gene regulatory networks that activate during reprogramming linked to X reactivation and which transcription factors could directly target X-linked genes for reactivation? To address this question, we needed a higher resolution single cell approach. So we, the, the approach that would enable us uh, to first resolve reprogramming heterogeneity and second, reconstruct gene regulatory networks that activate during reprogramming, and then use those networks and integrate them with kinetics of X reactivation to identify potential transcription factors that might directly target X chromosome for reactivation. So to do that, uh, we repeated our reprogramming experiment, but this time performed single cell RNA sequencing. And this allowed us to recover over 500 single cell transcriptomes uh, with distinct groups uh, representing unreprogrammed cells, reprogramming intermediates, and induced pluripotent stem cells. And we also observed this expected heterogeneity within reprogramming intermediates. However, in this case, it was using and using single cell approaches, it was easy to resolve this heterogeneity. And I did this in two ways. First, by clustering cells so that the cells with a similar transcriptome will be grouped together in the same cluster. And second, by reconstructing reprogramming trajectory and aligning cells according to reprogramming pseudotime. Here, the farther the cells have progressed in reprogramming, the higher the value of pseudotime will be assigned to those cells. And with this, I could then order the cells based on their clusters and by reprogramming pseudotime. And this allowed me to follow gradual trans how cells gradually transit through main hallmarks of reprogramming, starting from the loss of somatic program through mesenchymal to epithelial transition, finally with activation of pluripotency network. So with this, I could next reconstruct gene regulatory network and observe how gene regulatory networks are remodeled during reprogramming. And to do that, once again, I used a computational tool Scenic, which allowed me to identify over 300 regulons um, active um, across three distinct regulatory states, somatic, intermediate, and pluripotent. And here we, rec we, we recovered um, activity of transcription factors that have already been known to be important for reprogramming, such as pluripotency transcription factors at FP42, as well as we also, we also identified many novel ones. For example, when we actually reconstructed transcription factor target network, we found that in the, in, in the cells in the intermediate state, there is a strong activation of GATA2 regulon. And GATA2 transcription factor has normally been associated with trophoblast placental regulatory networks. So its activation here in the intermediate cells could help better explain and understand why reprogramming sometimes leads to these alternative outcomes. Finally, given this detailed um, mapping of gene regulatory networks that activate during reprogram reprogramming, I could ask uh, which transcription factors could directly bind um, X-linked genes for reactivation. And I did this using two approaches. First, I reconstructed, I constructed a simple logistic regression model, which helped me identify regulons that are predictive of X reactivation. And I found that regulons, which are active in cells that also always reactivated the X chromosomes, include transcription factors such as p53 or pluripotency transcription factors at FP42. Now, in the second approach, I asked which of those transcription factors could actually target X-linked genes. Which of those transcription factors in the network have the highest number of X-linked targets? And I did that by ranking regulons based on the number of X-linked targets. And this revealed that ZFP42 regulon has the highest number of X-linked targets, while P53 is way lower down the list. So this is pointing to ZFP42 
true. And this is very interesting because ZFP42 has already been previously shown to, um, to repress X chromosome inactivation indirect by indirectly repressing EXIST. And it also has been shown to have evolved together with EXIST. But the role of uh, ZFP42 in X reactivation was, is still unknown. So this data shows that ZFP42 could be a factor that would couple the evolution of pluripotency regulatory network with X chromosome reactivation. So currently we are testing the role of ZFP42 and other candidate factors in X reactivation. The last question that I would like to discuss today is what happens to the active X chromosome during reprogramming? I mentioned at the beginning that some studies um, suggest the presence of X upregulation in mammals, and some studies um, uh, refute these findings. Here in our data, we find evidence that suggests the presence of X upregulation in somatic cells, in mouse mammalian cells because we can see here that before reprogramming in somatic cells in mouse embryo fibroblasts, the ratio between the active X chromosome and autosomes is much higher than the expected 50%. And more intriguingly, we also observe that during reprogramming, this upregulation of the active X chromosome is gradually erased at the rate seemingly proportional to the rate of X reactivation. So this suggests that during reprogramming, the dosage of both X chromosomes is tightly regulated. Moreover, using another single cell data set, we observe that if after reprogramming, iPS cells lose one of their two X chromosomes, the remaining X chromosome also upregulates. This suggests that X chromosomes somehow sense the dosage of X-linked genes um, and um, respond uh, accordingly to maintain the right dosage of X-linked products. So then we wanted to better understand how is X upregulation and its erasure mediated. And for that, we performed allele-specific attack sequencing. This technology allows us to, um, to identify chromatin regions, which are open and accessible for binding of transcription factors and which chromatin regions are inaccessible. And by doing so, we found that in fibroblasts, the, active, the chromatin accessibility of, accessibility of the active X chromosome is enhanced. It's strongly, the active X chromosome is more accessible. And in line with the erasure of transcriptional X upregulation, this enhanced chromatin accessibility in the somatic cells is also gradually erased during reprogramming. And this is very interesting because enhanced chromatin accessibility of the, of the X chromosome has been previously shown in Drosophila, but not yet in, in mammals, which would suggest that both flies and mammals evolved independently and they evolved similar strategies to mediate dosage compensation and gene dosage. And this led us to propose a model which could um, explain the steps involved in X chromosome reactivation and involved in achieving and maintaining the right dosage of X-linked genes in the cell. And we propose that X chromosome reactivation can be divided into three phases, initiation, progression, and completion. In the initiation phase, um, the early activation of pluripotency regulatory network causes exist to start to recede from the inactive X chromosome. And this enables genes located in proximity to escapee genes to reactivate early. As we've shown before, a subset of genes initiates reactivation early. And we are, we are also currently investigating whether factors such as ZFP42 could directly target those genes for X reactivation. In the progression phase, um, the pluripotency networks is, network is completely established, exist is completely silenced, and this allows uh, chromatin to reacquire chromatin accessibility and its architecture and chromatin interactions. And it's also concomitant with the loss of repressive chromatin modifications and histone modifications, such as histone deacetylases. And this allows most of the genes to reactivate. 
In the completion phase, uh, chromo X chromosome reacquires its accessibility, chromosome wide accessibility, and chromosome topology, all, and all the genes can reactivate. And at the same time, it, X, in X chromosome also reacquires its comp competence to induce random X inactivation again. At the same time, on the other side of the nucleus, the active X is initially transcriptionally upregulated and, and features enhanced chromatin accessibility. And this is to compensate for the lack of mRNA products from the inactive X chromosome. However, as the inactive X chromosome reactivates, this upregulation and enhanced chromatin accessibility of the active X chromosome is gradually erased, so that in the end, the two active X, two X, chromo, two active X chromosomes maintain the correct dose of X-linked genes. And to summarize, um, today I showed you first how we um, evaluated whether we can capture totipotency in vitro. We asked if totipotent stem cells can be isolated and maintained. And we also established criteria that can be used to judge totipotency in vitro. Our data shows that EPS cells are not yet totipotent and the search for totipotent stem cells is, is still ongoing. At the same time, our data also provides a valuable resource uh, for community which would allow to assess any novel stem cell type. And this hopefully can propel our research and, and, and lead to a better understanding of mouse of, of pre-implantation development. In the second part, we tried to understand how is chromatin silencing erased. And to do that, we used sex dosage compensation during reprogramming as a model. We identified that X chromosome reactivation is very dynamic and different genes reactivate at different times. And our data suggests that this dynamic X reactivation is an outcome of combinatorial effect of chromosome topology, long encoding RNAs, histone modifications, and and transcription factors. And indeed, we identified uh, transcription factors such as um, ZFP42, which might link the evolution of gene pluripotency gene regulatory network to dosage compensation mechanisms. And we also showed that during reprogramming, the dosage of both X chromosomes is tightly regulated in cells. And altogether, these fundamental insights might not only lead to better understanding of development and reprogramming, but, but might also be very important in the context of X-linked and other diseases where the, which might be caused by incorrect gene dosage. And with that, I would like to thank everyone who was behind all that work with me, in particular, entire uh, PASC lab with in particular Vincent for his invaluable supervision and guideline, guidance throughout these projects, to Irene Talon with whom we've been working together on the X reactivation, also master students Bart, Ryan and Tina, our collaborators from KU Leuven, Florian, Reed and Thomas who helped us with SmartSeq2 experiments, all the international collaborators and, um, and of course thank you for, for listening.